Hi, I'm Dennis Lahane. I'm the author of The Given Day. We're starting here at Fenway Park as a sort of tour of some of the um, historical places that show up in this book. The Given Day is set in 1919. It's the last year that Ruth played for the, uh, Babe Ruth played for uh, the Boston Red Sox. So I was trying to look at that as a rather pivotal event in the city, the moment when he was traded. I grew up with my father working just a block from here. So uh, it's always been a, a special place to me. I, I don't think I'm, I'm very good for whatever reason, um, or interested in writing about, for lack of a better word, the sort of post 9-11 YouTube generation. It's just not where my strengths lie, it's not where my interests lie. But I, can, I think I can look at the present uh, by investigating the past. And I thought this event, the police strike of 1919, um, just had a lot of echoes to the present, the reverberations up into the present in terms of w what was going on in the country at the time. So. Um, that's, and also it was just, it was a police strike for God's sakes. I mean, it was, how cool is that? The entire police department walked off the job. That's, that's crazy, you know? Um, and I, I always approach a book from a little kid standpoint in that way, you know? The entire police department walked off the, excuse me? You know, we're under army control for four months? That's, on some level, that's just cool. That's just flat out cool. There's gotta be some, some cool stuff in there. And so that's, that's what led me to, to look at the time period and to write about the time period. So right now we're in um, the north end of Boston, which uh, it plays a very pivotal role in the novel. It's where um, it was at the time the sort of seat of uh, the Italian immigrants uh, was for 80 years, where most of the Italian immigrants lived. And um, it was also uh, where a lot of terrorists of the time lived, because most of the terrorism came out of um, the Italian anarchist movement. And so uh, this is uh, a neighborhood in which uh, English was definitely the second language. And then at, um, in January of 1919, uh, on this site right here, was a molasses tank um, used for uh, industrial purposes and it exploded um, because of hot weather, essentially. And uh, they, of course, immediately blamed terrorists for it, but it was actually a company error. And uh, the molasses uh, went down went down here um, and into the north end in um, 40 to 60 foot waves. Uh, 20 people were killed, it sounds funny, but then you hear 20 people were killed and you go, oh, not so much. They would claim, even my mother would claim back in the day, like as late as the 1970s, that if you went into the north end on hot days, you could still smell the molasses coming up through the cobblestone. I don't know if that's true. I, I probably said I smelled it when I was a kid, but I'm not sure I did. The molasses flood was actually, ended up being, um, uh, very problematic in the book. I kept trying to have uh, there be eyewitnesses to the actual molasses flood. And in a book that already had the Spanish flu, that has a, you know two massive riots in it, um, that had or originally at one point World War I sections, uh, the molasses flood just seemed to be, uh, I believe the term is gilding the lily. Yeah, I, I, I just, the, the entire idea of the book came from reading about this part of history, this one year in American history, and saying, oh my God, I can't believe this many things happened. I have to, first it was supposed to be a book about the Boston police strike, but it really became a book about that one year from the end of World War I, well actually the last time the Red Sox won the World Series to the Boston police strike, in which every day you turned around and the world was in some ways busting at the seams. And, and I just, um, I wanted to convey that. I wanted to, to write a book about that. To me, it's gotta be one of the most interesting years in the 20th century. Now we're standing outside the Warren Tavern, which uh, is one of the oldest taverns in America. Um, and it's actually a place where several of the characters show up in the book. Um, meet in the book, Danny, the major character, meets uh, um, several people in this tavern at various points during the book. Um, this is, the neighborhood is Charlestown, which is the oldest neighborhood in Boston. It's um, also a place where I lived. It was the neighborhood that inspired Mr. Grover. Um, so I have a great uh, affinity for this neighborhood as well. You'll hear that repeated over and over again. I have a great affinity for the neighborhoods of Boston. So um, yeah, and behind us is the, uh, the Bunker Hill Monument. Um, it's where the Battle of Bunker Hill was fought. P part of the problem when you write a book set in 1919 is you better know that a place existed. 
You know, so if you say, you know, Doyle's Pub or whatever, well, it probably didn't exist back then. But as you can see, 1780, we know it was here. So I could have a scene set here, no problem, and not have to fact check it. Unless I'll probably find out that it was closed for repairs between 1919 and 1920. But anyway. Two things that got me to write this book, or to put, sort of put the hook in. Uh, one was um, when I heard about a cavalry charge down Beacon Hill, um, which was pretty exciting to me. And the other was I heard this crazy, crazy story, and it turned out to be true, that the Brahmins, which is what we call the, the rich sort of blue bloods of Boston, um, they decided to kind of pitch in to the whole um, anti-riot effort by arming the Harvard football team. And that's what they did. They gave them rifles and they sent them to the Broadway Bridge to help control the crowd. And some of those students um, fired on the crowd and killed people. And for somebody who grew up in, in Dorchester, um, which is the inner city next town over, um, with my class rage issues, I really didn't need much more to go with uh, once I found out they gave rifles to the Harvard football team. So, um, so that was, this was one of the major catalysts for the book, was the envisioning that moment um, right here in 1919. So right now we're in South Boston, um, which we're at the tip of South Boston where, where it meets the Broadway Bridge, which leads into downtown. And this was, at the time of the Boston police strike, this was uh, the Irish ghetto. Um, and it was the uh, center of most of the unrest in the, when the police went on strike. Within 10 minutes of the police, literally 10 minutes of the police walking off the job, uh, the city began to riot. And um, on the second night of rioting, they came up with the idea of having the police push all the rioters this way to the base of the Broadway Bridge and to have the army coming over the bridge or the state guard um, and the militia, which was a bunch of uh, volunteers, mostly from Harvard, um, coming over the bridge from here. And the idea was to contain everybody here, um, right where the station is, Broadway station is right now. Um, unfortunately, what happened is somebody got a little overzealous and fired into the crowd and several people were killed and several people were wounded and that effectively ended the Boston police strike riots. Um, pretty much ended right here. The next day they set up machine gun turrets um, pointing in at the square uh, to keep the crowd in line. So uh, this was sort of the, I guess the epicenter for the uh, Boston police riots. We're on Beacon Hill, the very top of Beacon Hill, as you can tell, with the State House. Um, and this is, this is where the cavalry charge was. There was an you know, actual bona fide uh, Made in America cavalry charge with the bugles, the whole thing. Um, and they came out of those porticos there, um, you know, at full gallop, hundreds of horses, and they went down into Scully Square. The philosophy of the governor, who was here, um, which was quite wrong, was that um, if the police went on strike, there would be no rioting for at least 48 hours. I don't know where he got this information, but he stood by it. He was adamant about it. So he wouldn't call out the state guard, and the mayor wanted to, and he was overruled. And within a half an hour of the Boston police walking off the job, the rioting began. Then 30 minutes. And so, um, and Coolidge refused to call out any reinforcements until the next day. And that was the day of the cavalry charge, and that was the day of the um, shooting at the Broadway Bridge. So um, it, was, uh, it was total chaos in the city for a good 24-hour period. This is uh, undoubtedly the most uh, um, political in terms of, it's a book about politics, about the way a city runs, um, and this would have been uh, the center of it with the mayor. This is where the mayor was, um, Andrew J. Peters, um, and uh, we're not terribly far from the State House, Pemberton Square, which is where the police department was. Basically everything was concentrated in this one little area. And this is where basically all the major decisions about how to deal with the Boston police strike were made. Or most of the arguments took place right here. Um, yeah, that's, um, I'm out. <laughs>